Um, Jason Brown needs no introduction. I think most of you know him, but still, I'll, I'll give a brief introduction. He's a clinical professor at the Department of Neurology at New York University Medical Center. He's the author of many books. He's a neurologist and also a Whiteheadian philosopher. His last book, I have it here, is called Reflections on Mind and the Image of Reality. It's just, it has just come out. It may be um, an, in, an interesting book for most of you. Okay, so now we can get started, Jason. Okay. Um, okay. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Well, first of all, I want to thank uh, you, Maria Therese, and the organizers for the kind invitation to uh, be with you uh, through uh, Skype or whatever today and to share some of the work that I've been doing in, in neuropsychology, brain psychology, and then uh, moving gradually into uh, problems of philosophy. Um, one of my favorite uh, remarks is by the astronomer Harlow Shapey, uh, who was talking uh, many years ago about the difference between experiments and theories. A theory, he said, is clear and precise, but is believed by no one except the one who discovered it, Well. Experiments are messy and exact things that are believed by everyone except the one who did the work. So um, I'm going to give you uh, a heavy dose of theory, but I want you to understand that it's based on uh, studies in clinical um, neurology, uh, looking at uh, neuropsychological problems, both from a descriptive and experimental standpoint. There's a huge body of material that I, I don't have time to go into. I'm just going to touch on it briefly today, uh, but um, you'll just have to take my word for it that this is not uh, ex cathedra. It doesn't come out of the air, but it's really developed out of the clinical uh, domain. And uh, over 20 years or more of study, I gradually uh, became aware of the connections. Uh, I hope you'll see some too, to uh, Whiteheadian theory. I I came to Whitehead through James and Bergson and uh, other process thinkers, uh, Dewey and, uh, and so on, Royce. Um, and these are the topics I want to talk to you about today. Uh, the nature of the symptom, uh, the nature of uh, objects and images, the relationship between the image and the object is a relation between the mind and the, and the world and how this microgenetic theory gives us a, a, an understanding of what the, uh, the nature of the mind-brain state, and then that, uh, again, leads to a theory of the present moment, the now. Uh, the nature of the symptom is a somewhat, uh, I sh should say, not esoteric, but somewhat uh, uh, re recondite topic for those people who study neuropsychology and may not fit uh, easily into a philosophy talk, but it's very important to me, and I think generally, uh, to have an understanding of the meaning of a symptom and how it's going to relate to some of the other material I'll talk to you about today. Uh, and I say this for several reasons. First of all, it was my intuition that the errors that patients make with focal lesions of the brain are um, revelations, so to say, or uncoverings of earlier phases that are normally submerged or bypassed or transformed to endpoints uh, in an act of cognition, an act of perception or, or thought. And so um, the symptom is a clue to the processing sequence underlying uh, cognition. Um, well, symptom uh, analysis has really suffered a great deal with the advent of cognitive science I was fortunate to spend a year at Rockefeller University with George Miller in the 70s uh, when the uh, when cognitive science was first uh, developed with a large grant from the Sloan Foundation. I participated in many seminars and I have a lot of battle scars to show for that. Uh, but the whole thrust of cognitive science was to shift psychology to a quantitative basis from the qualitative aspect of symptoms which were viewed as anecdotal, uh, subjective, highly interpretable, non-reproducible, um, actually uh, the sparks that fly out of a radio when you throw a hammer into it, 
uh, basically meaningless. Um, and that was partly because we had no theory of the symptom. Uh, symptoms were viewed as, um, by people who study them, as the, um, the activity of areas neighboring the damaged part of the brain or opposite the damaged part that could be the result of inhibition or disinhibition. Uh, Pavlov had a theory of what he called equalization of association strength, so that the, the effect of a brain lesion was to eliminate association biases, so almost anything could pop out of the patient's head. So when a patient is asked to name a chair and says table, a patient who has a, that, that particular kind of aphasia, and misnames, that um, for Pavlov and others would, would reflect either, for some people that they think it's a guess, and, uh, but I, I'd like to show you that an understanding of the symptom can lead to uh, an understanding of other aspects of cognition and eventually led to the, the whole theory of the mind brain state. Um, another way of thinking about uh, symptoms is from a standpoint of regression. Uh, that is to say that symptoms unpeel the onion skin of development, but this has been really largely refuted uh, by a number of studies of acquisition of grammar and the uh, decay with pathology of grammar, showing that it does not reproduce stages in, in acquisition. So I think there's a grain of truth in the regression theory. I'll, I'll come to that. But uh, for the most part, it has been largely abandoned. Um, in the uh, early uh, work, uh, in microgenesis, uh, my, the relationship of pr processing sequence in an act of cognition, uh, the microgenesis of, of an act of cognition, was related to phylogenetic stages in the uh, growth of the forebrain. And um, I should say that microgenesis is a, a term that was coined by Heinz Werner from the German actual genese, uh, which means a momentary development in the present. And it is uh, the idea that you have submerged uh, uh, stages, uh, hidden unconscious phases in the development of every momentary state. Uh, and uh, there was an attempt made to correlate the microgenetic sequence with phyletic history of the, uh, uh, of the evolution of the forebrain. And uh, the uh, one could do this because in phylogeny you have millions of years to tease structure apart. So you can speak of planes of limbic formation and so on uh, and functional development. Well, the problem for me was ontogeny because in ontogeny or maturation, the brain is developing as a whole and function is developing as a whole. Uh, and as I said, the regression theory was uh, strongly refuted. So there was no really good way of bringing back uh, onto Genesis, so one had a phylo onto microgenetic theory that was consistent across all uh, all of these uh, ways of thinking. Um, so I, I just want to show you this slide very briefly, and I want you to kind of ignore everything on the right side of it. Uh, uh, this is uh, from an old work in which, again, as a patient is trying to name a chair, it comes up with very different kinds of responses. Um, they may come up with something like a, a wheelbase, which might refer to wheelchair, uh, it's not clear, an association error like throne, uh, an, error, an error like table, which is within the category of furniture, uh, or a phonological error, share. Now, careful study of these aphasia types shows that there's a progression in the development of a, a lexical item from fields of wide semantic distance mm -hmm. to narrower fields, eventually zeroing in on the target category, say furniture, and then within the category, the correct or incorrect item is uh, uh, elicited. Uh, I think it's really a very important principle of brain activity that, uh, that categories are respected uh, in, in error formation. So a patient has to name a color red is not going to say um, dress or uh, Venezuela is going to say green or blue or reddish or oranges or something like that. 
if they're asking a piece of furniture, uh, they're not going to say uh, glasses. We can get, we can see all sorts of strange responses, even low frequency words. Uh, you're, if someone is asked to name glasses, a pair of glasses, they may say spectacles, they may say telescope. There are ways of doing these kinds of responses. And I don't want to get into the techni technical aspects of it. But the point I'm trying to emphasize here is that you have a zeroing in from categories of wide distance in meaning relations to those of narrow distance. And finally, the, the category. And then once you get the category, a lexical frame of some sort emerges. And then you have a, 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 a after that, you have a zeroing in on the target phonemes to fill the slots in this abstract lexical frame. Uh, so what this shows is that there is a category item or category member or whole part transition from uh, core from core to surface from the earlier to the later. Uh, and I again, I think that the whole part context item uh, category member. Uh, frame content, however you want to phrase it, specification of parts out of holes. Uh, a kind of qualitative muriology is the basic pattern, from my observation, the basic pattern of brain activity. And anybody that would come up with a mathematical description of a qualitative muriological, not self-similar fractals. My theory has been compared by some other people to fractal theory. But there you have self-similar re replications. Here there's a qualitative transition from the whole to the part or category to the member. And, um, or I could say from potential to actual, or as Whitehead may have put it, from generality to precision. So he also saw it uh, as a, a zeroing in on the, uh, on what he called definite, the final definiteness. Um, well, one of the things that became obvious to me in looking at the anatomy uh, associated with these conditions is that the earlier stage in word finding was associated with um, earlier limbic cortex, the intermediate phases with the generalized cortex, and the phonological errors were associated with a focal neocortex, um, so that one could relate successive moments or segments or planes in the, in the uh, emergence of a word. Uh, in, micro time, we're talking about a fraction of a second, maybe 50 or 100 milliseconds, a, a tenth or a twentieth of a second, uh, for, it's been estimated for the uh, single mental state. Um, so that was the beginning of the microgenetic idea that was formed over 10 or 15 years of study of aphasia. And then it became clear to me that you could study perception, action, emotion, other aspects of cognition really from the same standpoint. And that led to uh, the theory of perception. Um, but before we get there, I want to say a word about the symptom, because this helps us to understand the nature of the mental state. Now, I told you that the problem for me with understanding uh, symptom formation was the, the difficulty in understanding ontogeny and the relation of ontogenetic growth to, um, to brain organization. Uh, we knew that uh, even if the um, uh, genetic code has, uh, some people have es estimated anywhere between 50,000 and a million genes for the, for the brain, uh, but we have trillions of connections uh, in the brain. So there can't be a one-to-one -one correlation between gene and, uh, and synapse. So people have looked for algorithms or epigenetic codes or translation mechanisms that take us from the genetic code to morphology and function. And two of the mechanisms that haven't looked at are parcelation and neoteny or heterochrony. I'll come to that in a moment. Parcellation is the idea that uh, in development, in fetal and postnatal development, you have exuberant growth and a gradual trimming away of irrelevant, redundant, or maladaptive possibilities so that you achieve specificity of innovation by elimination, not by selective growth. 
And this is really uh, uh, an astonishing amount of elimination that occurs. The neuroscientist Rakesh, in a study of the macaque monkey at the age of six years, which is the age of sexual maturity in a macaque, uh, using a, uh, uh, teams of uh, unfortunate graduate students and electron microscopes, examined the brains of the macaque and estimated that something like two trillion synapses were lost uh, by the age of six years in the monkey in order to achieve specificity of input. And that's what parcellation refers to, the loss of cells and connections uh, in morphogenesis and the formation of the brain in fetal and postnatal life. So we can look at this a little more closely. This is taken from a paper by a fellow named Goodwin, who is a evolutionary theorist. And what he shows is the, the, uh, the transition from the genes through development to morphology. And then the, the assumption that morphology outputs functions into behavior. And what you have are people who study different levels in this. So you have geneticists, developmental biologists, you have people who look at morphology, the people who look at functions and those who study behavior. But he argued, and I think correctly, that we have to think of the development in terms of a four-dimensional process in which uh, you have the early stages in which form is laid down in the form of structure and later stages in which form is laid down in the form of a process or function, so to say. So that on this basis, the cognitive process is an extension of the early growth process in the fetal brain and shows similarities to uh, the morphogenetic uh, process. In other words, cognition is a, is a mode of growth. It's not simply the output of established connectivity. And this is taken from one of the earliest papers on parcellation by a fellow named Ebison in the behavioral brain sciences. And it shows how you have a overlapping connectivity and then gradual loss of the overlap or redundancy, so to say, and you have the one-to-one -one innervation. This is from a more recent paper by the French biologist Sean Joe, his book, Neuronal Man, in which you have initial exuberant growth and then what he calls transient redundancy uh, and then selective stability or stabilization where you have elimination of unfit uh, or uh, redundant or unnecessary or maladaptive connections. Actually, this is really an evolutionary way of thinking about uh, morphogenesis, that the brain development follows evolutionary patterns in that just as the environment eliminates unfit organisms, unfit connections are eliminated in the growth of the brain. Now, I want to uh, argue with you that what happens uh, is that initially you have the elimination of cells and connections to establish specificity. And then when you achieve a relatively stable connectivity, inhibition takes the place of elimination as a means of establishing further specification. Uh, and there are many examples, I will bore you with that, that one can show that inhibition is the continuation of elimination after some degree of morphological maturity, so to say, has been achieved. Uh, the famous uh, neuropsychologist, neurosurgeon Carl Primer uh, reviewed some of this material and argued for what he called force lines, force lines in develop early development that continue into cognition uh, as, as the pattern of, uh, of the, uh, form the pattern of the cognitive process uh, and parcellation of the particles. So again, we have here uh, a, a sculpting like effect or a trimming effect or parsing of holes into parts or, or backgrounds into figures or of, of more general into more specific items. Uh, it keeps repeating the same, the same thing. Well, if parcellation is the um, pattern of growth that continues into the human brain, 
Uh, neoteny refers to the rate of growth. Uh, heterotony generally is the term that's used for rate of growth. Neoteny refers to a selective slowing or retardation of, of, of growth that can lead to evolutionary advance or in some cases to evolutionary monsters. Uh, this picture is taken from the book by Stephen Gould on ontogeny and phylogeny, and it's the well-known depiction of the so-called fetal ape concept of human development, where you see in juvenile chimp uh, the, uh, a much more human-like appearance in the, the rounded skull, the upright posture, the flattened muzzle, the, the smaller superorbital ridges, and so on. And what this uh, implies is that evolutionary advance occurs as a um, uh, slowing down or retardation of development uh, so that uh, certain processes can continue. They don't shut down, they don't close down. One very good example of that is the, uh, op the, uh, the fact that in humans we have open cranial sutures at birth and um, this allows the brain to undergo considerable growth in the first year or so of life. Uh, if the sutures were closed, as in other animals at birth, the brain could not expand. And if the brain was larger, the head could not fit through the pelvic canal. So open cranial sutures, which is a neotenous feature, that is to say, it's a retardation or uh, juvenilization, so to say, that is postponed or extended further into development than ordinarily it should be. Uh, and increased brain growth is also a neotenous feature. It occurs especially during the fetal life, but this allows it to continue in the postnatal period. Um, this, the fact of the otony we see in, in many other areas other than green brain growth, for example, in the period of sexual maturity, we know that in the lemur, just looking over the primate series, in the lemur, uh, sexual maturity is reached at approximately age two, in the apes at age seven, and in humans around 12. So we have a progressive prolongation, which again is a neotenous feature. Now, this then would refer to the rate of development, whereas parcellation to the pattern. And I want to show you how this helps us to understand the nature of an error. As I said uh, previously, um, most uh, neurologists would tend to think, uh, and I think most people, just of common sense, would lead people to think that uh, damage to a part of the brain destroys, or damages, or disables whatever is functioning in that part of the brain, whether a strategy, a representation, an operation, a process, a box or a narrow and a flow diagram. Uh, on this model, uh, brain processes is look more like uh, looked at more like a wave front uh, or a wave front rather than as a, uh, a sequence that goes from a box to arrow to another box. And an air and a, uh, a lesion in the brain is viewed like a rock that's put in the middle of a stream. And so what happens is that you have a selective slowing down of uh, operations, let's say, that uh, depend on that area, uh, while other areas are, that are not affected continue normally. So let's go back to the example I gave you earlier in aphasia, where somebody says table for chair. So one could argue that the process has reached the, the stage of furniture, the category of furniture, and then the patient comes up with a uh, table. What's interesting is that table is then successively processed phonologically in a normal way. So this is simply an error that is carried through to completion, but is completed through no subsequent normal processing. Um, now, in a case like this, if the patient uh, is asked to name chair and actually says chair, in a way that could be a wrong response. It could be an error. Because when you study these patients, you find that they use words in a holophrastic manner, like children who say daddy for every man or doggy for every animal. The words don't have the referential specificity that 
they should normally have. And I've written about this in studies of semantic boundaries, and you find uh, over-inclusion of semantic boundaries and a weakening of the boundary, uh, and more flexibility and so on. So um, uh, the, the thing is, you what you have here is a progressive specification reaching the category, and then either the right or the wrong item comes out, but here it's selectively slowed, and this is what's giving you the misnaming. And you also have, in parcellation, you have the zeroing in on the target category where uh, the inhibition uh, that followed elimination in development now becomes the suppression of alternative routes of development that allow one item to emerge with clarity so that in a whole part transition, you have parts that are virtual until they specify and other uh, possible parts that never uh, are realized and they die stillborn, so to say. And so here you have inhibition or um, uh, suppression or, or, what, or sculpting, uh, you know, so that only the item that is adapt most adaptive emerges. And I'll come back to this in a bit, but this is, a, this is then the microgenetic theory of the symptom. And uh, it, I think we'll sh I show you that it relates to some other features of perception and uh, mind-brain relations. Now, this is a slide taken from a paper by Terry Deacon, an evolutionary anthropologist, that illustrates the difference between the standard model of perception and the microgenetic account of perception. I should say that uh, over the last months, I, I was revisiting this, this way of thinking, my microgenetic model, which uh, was developed, uh, oh, in the 70s or 80s or so, and then refined over the years. Uh, and uh, it was always a problem because the standard model were basically ob object uh, features, uh, the, the, line, the, the boundaries of an object, its size, its shape, its color, its motion. The, those features that we see in the world are internalized as features in the mind, brain, that are recognizing the features as they come in through sensation. So sensation provides the material for the assembly of an object from an initial detection of lines and angles to the construction in, of 2D shapes, and then that passes to the construction of 3D shapes, and then that is transferred to limbic temporal regions for recognition or to the parietal lobe for spatial updating on the changing uh, environmental array. So that basically you have a naked object to which recognition is added and, um, and, and spatial uh, embedding of the object in, in the spatial environment is also uh, a secondary process. Now in revisiting this whole topic, it seemed that the, V1 to V2 to V3 part of it, the object assembly or object construction has been relatively well accepted by many researchers, but the transition to V4 for recognition is very problematic and, uh, and, and has, has not really been definitively, and this is, this is almost 50 years of study now of the Hugo Wiesel Nobel experiments uh, and their, their studies really reflected a way of thinking about perception that goes back way over 100 years before there were mid-1800s. Well, uh, on the classical model, sensation actually, or sense data actually go into the construction of the object. On the microgenetic model, everything is turned upside down so that you have in the upper brainstem, you have the initial formation of a 2D construct, 30% of the fibers of the optic nerve go to the upper brainstem. That's a, a huge amount of fibers, uh, much more than is needed for the pupillary reflex. And it has been shown in experiments that you, and argued that you get a 2D representation of, of the object in the upper brainstem uh, with this fairly sizable input from the, uh, visual, from the visual system. Then the argument is that passes to the limbic temporal region where there's a relative suspension of input. So the developing object or pre-object can pass through systems of meaning relations, experiential memory, 
affective tonality and through a space that is more dreamlike, uh, egocentric, volumetric space. Um, from there, uh, hallucinatory space. From there, the object goes to parietal area where there is some input and achieves a, uh, uh, a object-centered space of Euclidean object relations. And then finally, this developing gestalt tr is transferred to the primary visual area where the final feature modeling is uh, applied and the developing configuration is specifies and externalizes as the object or the object world uh, detaches so these things from the mind and becomes the world outside. In my way of thinking, the world around us is simply the endpoint of the object of an endogenous process of object formation. And uh, I, I sometimes feel it's like being inside an orange and looking at the inside of the peel of the orange peel. It's kind of a schizophrenic way of thinking about perception. Um, but uh, so that the object world is the rim of the mind. And there are many pathological conditions that which reveal the fact that there is a transition from, uh, from the psychic to the extra psychic or from the mental to the uh, uh, objective. In this model, you go from a memory-like to a perception-like uh, construct. You go from past to present. You go from subjective to objective depth to surface from the archaic in evolution to the recent in evolution. Um, you go from feeling as internal value, either drive or desire as inner value, to feeling accompanying the, de the development of the object out into the world as object worth of an object. And um, uh, the whole process is endogenous where a sensation acts to constrain the object formation. That is to say, it sculpts or delimits or, or parses the object development. So only the, the, the object that develops is a, the object that is adapted to the world outside. So the world outside, in this view, constrains the development so that it, it forms a map, a mental map of external reality. Um, and unlike the classical model where you assemble an object, you then recognize it, and then you have to project it back out into the world. Here you have a continuous, as I said, sheet of mind that goes from the initial stages to the end point of the world. So there's no, there's no projection. Uh, it's just a continuous uh, uh, flow of mentation outward, and it's all endogenous. So sensation doesn't go into the object, it constrains the object development to become whatever it becomes at that moment. Um, okay. Well, we can collapse that, that uh, picture. And this gives us uh, uh, a picture of the brain state from the standpoint of perception, where you go from a 2D map to an egocentric or volumetric uh, uh, viewer-centered space mediated, I would argue, by the limbic system to a parietal three-dimensional object space uh, that's not fully detached. And we know this because, for example, the people with parietal lobe lesions, they can see the outer world through the mirror. They don't have problems with that. But when they're asked to do tasks where they have to construct objects before them or they have to uh, do some drawings and so on, they have problems with uh, limb uh, coordination, eye-hand coordination, relating to sp space in the in the space of the arm's reach, which is the which is the space of the young child, of the infant. It's also the space of the congenital divine. So the problem is in an immediate space, um, and also we know that patients who have hallucinations, when they reach for the hallucination, the hallucination usually disappears. So the, this is a space where the, the object world is not fully independent, not fully formed, which is achieved, I would say, through this huge occipital input that analyzes this developing background gestalt into the final figural detail. Now, if we kind of generalize from that way of thinking about perception, and I, I gave you a similar way of thinking about language, 
uh, I would say, first of all, I should, I should mention that the theory of perception is consistent certainly with Bergson, uh, who argued that perception is an active process, not a passive in processing. Uh, and this is a, a way of thinking about perception in an active sense. Uh, and here, if we put this together in terms of uh, what might be some of the contents of a mental state, the argument is that you go from a core unconscious self through categorical primes of instinctual drive, hunger and sexual drive, which are primitive categories, uh, uh, prey and predation, uh, edi what's edible, what's not edible, and so on, a sexual mate, what's not a proper sexual mate. So there are categories and you have drive feeling associated with those categories. Then I would argue that that drive uh, feeling is uh, parsed to an empirical self that is at the threshold of consciousness um, and conceptual feeling, which is uh, concepts with affective tonality. So the primitive categories are then derived to or specified to concepts where the feeling is the, the affective tone of the concept Feeling and idea do not come together in the brain. This is uh, going back to Freud, who thought that you have uh, ideas and then you have libidinal drive energy, which affects or attaches to the ideas. There's no way that you could have a model like that because either you have a multiplicity of feelings innately in the, in the brain and then the concept finds the proper feeling or you have uh, a pool of feeling that is finds a, a an appropriate address on the idea. Uh, it seems to me the only reasonable way of thinking about it is to say that concept and feeling are part of the same complex. I've written about this as the concept forming the, the being of the act and the feeling giving rise to the becoming of the act. And so what you have is a becoming into being um, that um, uh, it, it incorporates this no, notion of feeling as in, inherent in concepts, even the most abstract concepts. As philosophers well know how they fight about uh, abstract concepts, there's a lot of affective tonality in, the, in their conceptual arguments. And this leads eventually to objects and acts. Uh, and I would also argue that Im imagery, verbal imagery, inner speech and uh, desires and uh, uh, introspective thought emerge uh, as an intermediate phase in the development of objects and acts. That is to say that introspection is not a higher level that's appended to uh, what has come, on, come before, but it emerges at more preliminary phases in the object development. Just as the neoteny, it's, it's a kind of neoteny a process because, uh, I mean, Freud said that, and other people have argued that thought develops in the delay of action so really, what is, there's a delay here in object formation and the delay, the object is realized, but there's a the delay, a point in the process that allows internal imagery to come to the fore. If this process is truncated here, then you have dream. But if you have a normal object world, then you have embedded in that the, the penultimate phase of verbal and visual imagery, which also satisfies the evolutionary principle that new form is not added to, but emerges from submerged layers, or Steve Blue put it this way, that um, evolution is not a ladder of progress, it's a branching push. So that new form comes from earlier, more homogeneous, more plastic form building layers, not from the endpoints of specialization. And again, going back to the same way of thinking, going from the self to the object and the image is intermediary, I'll make a case that the earlier phase associated with long-term memory, intermediate with short-term, and then finally leading to perception. So that perception, and I will show you and try to convince you, that perception develops out of memory. And that is also in keeping with, uh, as Merleau-Ponty said, we remember objects into perception. Some of you may recognize uh, this picture taken from the psychology of William James. And James was uh, um, writing about the problem of self-identity. And he did not think that you could have a series of mental states. He called them 
drops of, co of uh, cognitive consciousness, I believe. Uh, he thought they, could have, they would have to be overlapping, not concatenated. So you couldn't have a causal chain or boxcar-like sequence of states. They had to overlap, and I would agree with that. And I'll, and I'll show how I can try to extend James's insight. Okay, here we have the mental state at T1, from the core to the surface, from memory to perception, uh, from the 2D to the, to the final feature analysis in the world, in a fraction of a second. And you have to, as Bergson would have said, you know, this is a 2D representation of, of a time. It's not, as he argued, it's not like standing over and seeing a line in time progress. This is really has to be thought of as a point that keeps replacing itself. Microgenesis is not a sequential model, a serial model of cognition, it's a recurrence model. So you have a poof, like in Buddhism, a poof, a poof, uh, one state, another state, another state, and uh, each state gets replaced. Now I'm gonna to come to that in a moment. So here you see the initial perception at T1 now, if you think of forgetting in, as decay, if you, if you talk about decay, what you're really saying is that there is a permanent trace. And if there is a permanent trace, then that would really be kind of inconsistent with process thinking. I don't think the trace is permanent. I think decay is incomplete revival. So what happens is that T1 is incompletely revived at successive points. And depending on the degree of revival, that's a, we term that either uh, iconic memory. We see this in eidetikers or people with photographic memories, for example, where they can immediately uh, ha ha have available to them a massive amount of information right after the perception. And iconic memory I won't go into unless you want to later on, but that's an immediate memory. And then as the uh, perception fades or is incompletely revived, you still can retain some physical features of the original stimulus, and we call that short-term memory. And then at some subsequent point, the revival does not reach the floor of consciousness, and as it falls below that floor, we speak of long-term memory. Um, and there we remember the meaning, or we remember the gist of what happened, but we don't have clear recall of the actual physical or featural detail of the perception. Now, I would claim that at some point in this process, the surface at uh, perception T2 or perception T3 um, is uh, the disparity between the surface and the floor to which the revival has reached or sunk, uh, is that disparity becomes the now or the present moment. It's, it's a disparity between the immediate present and the remembered past, so to say. Um, let me show you that a little bit more clearly in the next slide. Oh, I should also say that in this process, we go from unconscious to conscious. And when in so doing, we're also going from, well, what Freud called the timelessness of the unconscious. Von Hartmann in his psychology of the unconscious before him spoke of the unconscious as timeless. I don't think timeless entities exist, so I think we should speak of it maybe as simultaneous rather than timeless. I think there's a simultaneity in the unconscious that unfolds and as, as serial order is achieved on arriving at consciousness, but that's another topic. Um, anyway, we can go from here to uh, collapse that diagram to the notion of a single mental state in 50 milliseconds from bottom to top, so to say, and recognizing that it's not the output of the state that matters, but the output consists of the entire state as uh, uh, the, the, whole, the, the earlier stages in the state are part of the final stages. It's, it's not a conveyor belt that leads to the end point, but the outcome of the state has implicit in it all of the earlier stages. And uh, when you T1 fades to a certain point, the disparity between the T2 perception and T1 uh, decay, I hate to use that word, but decay or forgetting 
is is translated into the phenomenal now. I think that has some similarities to the binocular disparity for depth perception, where you have a virtual image between the monocular perception and that virtual image aids in perceiving depth. Whitehead said somewhere that the third dimension of space is the ghost of transition. Now, I can't find that reference. Maybe some of you know it, but I love the reference. It certainly sounds Whiteheadian. Um, and the, I guess the argument would be that the, th that the third dimension of space, depth here, which is achieved through binocular disparity, is analogous to the temporal disparity that gives you the now. And we can see how the forward edge of the now in perception uh, is pr pretty much fixed in perception, but the, the, uh, the prior, uh, the floor of the now in memory can vary in states of meditation or in pathological states uh, so that you can have a expansion or a narrowing of the duration of the present moment. Um, this is uh, a slide that, uh, oh, let me, just, let me just say I have a, uh, I should have mentioned to you a wonderful quote by Whitehead, and I'm trying to bring my work into relationship, obviously, with Whiteheadian thinking. Whitehead says, and he said something similar in several places, there is no essential reason why memory should not be raised to the vividness of the present fact. And on this theory, Really, perception is largely memory. Memory forms the endogenous substrate of a perception, while sensibility constrains memory so that what, what emerges as the perception is memory transformed into what's adaptive given the momentary world around you. Uh, so, that, and, and memory not only includes what's remembered, but it includes all of the earlier stages in the in the uh, in the mental state, as I said. Now, one of Whitehead's uh, most interesting uh, arguments had to do with the paradoxical nature of time, in that, and I hope I'm getting this correct. Uh, I feel a little uncomfortable in neurologist speaking to a audience of people who know the material better than I do. But my understanding of his thinking here is that. A thing does not exist, an entity does not exist until it completes one cycle of its existence, whether it's a hypothetical atom requiring one complete revolution of an electron uh, or a mental state that requires completion of the mental state. Either it completes itself to a perception or to uh, you eliminate the final stage and you have a dream, so you have a dream state. But in order to, for the state to exist as a state, as anything, it has to have have finished one cycle of itself. So the outcome is that the, the state consists of all of its ingredients from the initiation of the state to the end point of the state. Now, if we take uh, James, uh, his thinking uh, seriously and states do overlap, what we come up with is the idea that T2 is overlapping T1 prior to the completion of T1. So what actually is overlapping are the earlier phases in T2 prior to the actualization of T1 and prior then to its existence as a mental state. So what this does is preserves continuity but it also preserves the early phases in the mental state, those associated with core beliefs, values, character, core personality, the presuppositions that Collingwood wrote about, the guide philosophical research. And um, while the surface of the state, when it finally completes itself, perception, so perception perishes so you make room for the next wave of, of perceptual realization. So you have to have a clean slate so you can have a new perception. But you also have to be able to preserve early stages so you have consistency of personality over time, of values and beliefs and so on over time. And I think this is a way of, uh, it's one theory of uh, realizing that. Um, the... Uh, Okay. 
I wanted to uh, conclude the talk with this lovely uh, painting by Magritte, one of my favorites. I've read many interpretations of the painting. Some of you may be familiar with it. The poem Deraclita, the Bridge of Heraclitus. Um, and none of the people I've read about this painting really go to the, the, the main uh, problem that Magritte is addressing, that is the debate between Parmenides and Heraclitus as to instantaneous and continuous time. Here you see in the Heraclitian River, you see the reflection of the bridge, the complete bridge, in, in, as, a, as a reflection. Is that illusory or is it not illusory? And here you see the bridge. Oh, goodness. Let me go back up. Here you see the bridge uh, truncated, but is it really instantaneous or is the rest of the bridge obscured by the clouds? So uh, is instantaneous time real or imaginary? Uh, is uh, continuous time imaginary? The time of uh, microgenetic theory is recurrent, potential to actual, unconscious to conscious, from simultaneity to serial order, and um, in overlapping, uh, overlapping states. Uh, so I will stop here, and mindful of the story of the professor who talked too long and finally apologized to his uh, audience, saying that he was sorry he talked so much, but unfortunately there's no clock in the room. And one of the people in the audience stood up and said, yes, professor, but there is a calendar. So, <laughs> so I think I will end on that note. And I suppose if, you have, if you'd rather go to lunch or ask me a few questions, I'm happy to try to answer them. Okay, Jason, thank you for your wonderful talk. Uh, we have uh, some time, not much, but we do have some time for some questions. Um, any questions? Could you comment on a, a situation where a, a person in a, a sees an accident or, or has a problem and then they can't remember it very well and then under hypnosis they can seem to have a better memory. Can you comment in terms of what you've been talking about that phenomenon? Well, uh, yes, I think, um, I mean, I think we've all had the experience of, uh, of having recall. I mean, I, I had this extraordinary experience the other day. I had gone a couple of months ago to hear the Brahms uh, piano trio number one, and I'm not a musician, you know, I can't play the piano very well. And, but I heard almost a complete uh, trio in my head in a drowsy state. And of course, there are many anecdotes about this in terms of creative work. Uh, Wagner and Das Reigel uh, composed a prelude composed in a uh, transitional dream state, Coleridge, and so on. Um, but um, I, I suppose it has something to do with the fact that in waking, you know, once you do, in order to achieve a perceptual world or in order to act, you have to eliminate other possibilities. So you, there's a, a selectivity that goes on that leads to the elimination of uh, background potential. And if you induce a trance-like state, you can presumably revive earlier phases in the perception or the experience that otherwise would be parsed away uh, on waking recall or, or just consigned to oblivion, for total forgetting. You know, I've often wondered in dreams that are completely forgotten, do they really shape our personality? Like, like waking experiences, the waking experiences will shape our personality for better or worse. But do dreams have any lasting effect on us? If we don't remember them, uh, I don't know. Maybe you can answer that question, but I've always wondered about that. Of course, the other interesting thing about memory is that is the question of how do you know that what you remember is accurate if you don't have a standard to compare it against? If you if you remember, how do I even know that what I remember actually happened? Uh, William James wrote that he felt at times that he was getting mixed up in other people's dreams. 
and uh, I've had the experience of wondering whether my experiences were, I'm remembering a dream or I'm remembering an experience or I'm remembering a thought I had. And so I think the, the subtle interaction of those states, I think shows, uh, in my work, I've always searched for continuities rather than discontinuities. Uh, most of psychology is trying to find a discontinuity and then package it and call it, give it a label. And I've always looked to find, you know, continuous transition from one, one thing to another. And, um, and so, uh, anyway, I just, as an aside, but I, I don't have a good answer to that, but I, I, I would also say that there are studies of, of uh, the uh, Lebensfilm phenomena, that is uh, people who have near death experiences and have uh, memories of, uh, of things that you know, their whole life passes before them. A very famous uh, neuroscientist uh, and mathematician, Mac Warren McCulloch, uh, I think he may have been a psychiatrist too. He hypnotized someone and he had this man try to recall, he was a bricklayer, and the man recalled every single brick in a wall that he had built 30 years before. And he checked it out and he recalled every brick in the in mortar in the wall. So uh, he, he argued for a, uh, that you have a total memory script in the mind and only a fraction of it is recoverable. Okay, any, any more questions? Well, I guess you want to go out and enjoy the beautiful weather. I don't blame you. Um, the, the large scale uh, elimination uh, that you described for a system of emerging pre conscious process, then that leads to, so to speak, a issue of uh, coherence or unity of the conscious experience. Uh, some people have suggested that perhaps you need to, one needs to do some, say, quantum uh, uh, notion to provide such coherence. Uh, uh, what do you think in terms of uh, what is it that helps uh, reintegrate or provide the coherence that is part of our conscious experience? Well, I tried to show that in the overlap and the, uh, and the uh, continuity of, uh, of the depth of the mental state uh, and the, the more superficial layers of the mental state, the perceptions, the, the momentary thoughts that we have, they tend to pass away. Um, my way of thinking is that if you, um, if you see an object and you, then you, you think about the object, or you see a work of art and then you're thinking about the work of art, you're not applying thought to the object. What you're doing is reviving the object. It's, it's being revived through earlier layers of, of uh, experiential memory, world knowledge, and so on, that are relatively stable at the core because there, there's an overlap before the state, as I said, before the state perishes. Um, and, uh, and this provides the coherence over states, the, the continuity across states. Uh, this is not really a, there's no, there's no actual correspondence uh, here. The only correspondence is the adaption, adaptation of the final phase of modeling of the uh, emerging gestalt to feature, to so feature detail model to the outer world or the changing outer world. But that, that's lost. So the continuity is provided at the core levels rather than intermediate levels. I think, but I, I'm not sure how I can have a better answer to that to the question. That was a question that James was dealing with in terms of identity and postulating overlap. He didn't, he didn't write with those overlapping diagrams were not meant to um, uh, deal with the problem of, uh, of the cell, for example, or the union problem of, uh, of the identity. They were meant to deal with the identity of the self that Hume raised, uh, where he said, you know, he can't find this, he can't find the self concept in his own mind, but there is definitely some identity of himself across states, and he left that for future generations to deal with. And I think this was an attempt by, by James to, to try to approach that problem. And so is mine. 
but um, uh, James did not write in terms of, uh, of time. Of course, the species present, but he did connect the species present to the overlap, as far as I know. Okay, one more question. Oh, I have a question. I find your theory is very Bergsonian. What do you think of that? Insomnia? <laughs> <laughs> well, I heard of a philosopher who had terrible insomnia and who wrote depressing uh, books that would give his readers insomnia, and that was the way he cured himself. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Jason.